actually quite nerve wracking being up here. And normally, when I've been to this con this conference before, I've been sitting in the audience. So I now understand what it's like, and I apologise if I don't make sense or I'm, I rabble. Like, come and talk to me in person later if you want to know more. So yes, this is Person Can Ross Remembers, um, and we're really grateful to be here today. Um, we really appreciate um, being accepted <laughs> to speak. Uh, and I'm not alone. I'm here today with. David Dykes from Flowers of the Forest, um, which is related to Perth Academy, and with Peter Olson from Schoon Remembers, and they're going to talk about their projects, but I'm going to give you a brief introduction to Perth and Kinross Remembers. Um, I'll save that slide first. So Perth and Kinross Remembers is a 12-month legacy project that started in August, the end of August this year, so we're just a little baby right now. It's been a lot of planning and admin. Um, and we start, we've been funded by the National, the National Lottery Heritage Funds now. We received funding from them and we've had support from our friends of Perth and Cross Archive, um, the Jimmy, I've forgotten the names, the <laughs> Perth Common Good Fund and the Jimmy Care and Cross Char Charitable Trust. Um, we, um, Perth and Cross Remembers sits within the Archive and Local History Service um, that um, is a part of Culture Perth and Cross. Uh, so, the main aims of our project, we have one key aim, the key focus, is the creation of a First World War legacy collection. During the 2014 to 18 commemorative period, a lot of groups and individuals carried out a lot, of, oh, like every community around Scotland and the UK, carried out a lot of hard work um, uh, and research projects into uh, the First World War, um, researching their local war memorials, their local First World War, First World war heritage, and had delivered a lot of outputs. And our main aim for Perth and Kinross Remembers is to gather and collate this, their material, their le project legacies into one big, oh, sorry, one big uh, First World War legacy collection that will sit within the Perth and Kinross archive. Um, it will be, we're looking, we're not fussy, we're looking at, um, you know, it could be a, a leaflet or a poster advertising an event that these community projects carried out. It will be lists of names from um, war memorials, um, tracing the lives of the soldiers. Um, it's it's about creating a space for this stuff to be remembered, stuff this material to be remembered, um, so that it can be appreciated by future generations. Um, and these are just a few of the community groups that we are working with that I could find logos for. So this is just the start. Um, we I think we've got about 20 community groups um, that we know of that we want to work with. I mean, by community groups, I mean project contributors who are individuals and groups. Um, and we want to work with them to collate their material and encourage them. So that's another aim is to encourage them to reflect on their successes and their achievements over the 2014 to 18 period. Um, and we are working with them, um, a couple of these groups, um, in conjunction with the Explore Your Archive campaign, um, which we are doing pop-up displays at each of the four community campuses in Perth and Kinross, and that um, we're encouraging them to create, curate their own little exhibition to narrate the journey of their projects. Um, and so we're working with Creef Remembers and Kinross Museum um, Ara Feldy at the moment and an individual from um, Perth as well on a display at North Inch Community Campus. Um, so that's another aim is, um, and that also kind of ties in with our events programme as well. So yes, just to recap, our second aim is to, I, I guess, I'll encourage the projects to reflect on all of their hard work and raise awareness of all of their work within the wider community of Perth and Can Ross. Our third aim is to run a series of events, you know, including talks and workshops, to raise awareness of their work, but also and kind of, I think, encourage Perth and Kinross to reflect on their experiences of, of on the, the local experiences of the First World War, um, and encourage people to remember to think why we remember. Remembrance is so important. It, it, it goes beyond the 2014 to 18 period. The First World War always needs to be remembered. And I'm looking to do this through quite a kind of creative programme of events with my colleagues in museums and libraries, trying to bring a creative and reflective element into it through you know, potentially doing um, kind of reading workshops, incorporating archive material. Um, the events are still in progress. So I have a list, but I just can't quite remember how many I've got up my sleeve. Um, and hopefully be working with external bodies um, 
bringing um, maybe some of my ex-colleagues in to give from HES to give some talks um, and maybe a couple of photography workshops and kind of encouraging audiences in Perth and Kinross to reflect on how war memorials have shaped the experiences of their local communities. Um, I could go on and talk and talk, but I won't because I'll just start rambling like I'm doing now. But we have actually got a website that we've just launched. So I can, we're, we're, we've got a station up the stairs and I can show you the website. We've got some really lovely um, postcards printed that we'd love you to take away. And you can get in touch with me at the bottom there and you can follow us with the hashtag CPK Remembers. I'm now going to hand over to two speakers, two representatives from two memorial groups, like I said, Schoon Remembers and Flowers of the Forest. And it's these two projects that have worked so hard um, over the past five years, plus pro probably more, to, um, <laughs> to remember the sacrifices made by their local communities. So without further ado, I'll hand over to David Dykes from Flowers of the Forest. So I'm doing the clicking, so I'm Our flowers of the forest, 168 boys and girls who never came home from the First World War. And in 2014, a group of young people at the school decided that they should honour their memory. And they named the project Flowers of the Forest. Couldn't be more apt. Um, so, next clip. Our first ceremony. Our journey begins. I want you to look at one person and remember the name. Her name's Georgina and she's hiding at the back. You can't see it because she's purposely hiding at the back. And I'll talk about her a little bit towards the end of the presentation. So our journey begins, our first ceremony. What they wanted to do was hold a ceremony, a short ceremony at the school, as close as they could to the centenary of the death of every single person. Some of them were amalgamated together, so there may have been two or three people. Certain key events in the war, there would be a number of people died on the same day or very close together. Next one. So, connections. Straight away, straight away we found that this was going to be much more than we thought it was going to be. And we started to make connections with people. With people who cared as much about these flowers of the forest as we did. I can only talk about one connection and one friendship. Oh, no, two connections and one friendship. If you look at the lady on the left hand side of the tartan skirt, her name's Alison, I want you to remember that name as well. This family are there because they are the grandchildren of Jack Seaver's sister, Marina. They came from Toronto, Kent, Lanarkshire and Monifeath. They came to the school in 2017 because they wanted to be there for a 10 minute ceremony. They didn't just come to the school, they, it was a connection that the family wanted to make as well. Next one, please. Another family. 2018, a lady got in touch with me from Aberdour. That's actually five miles away from where I live. And this thing had been flying around the internet for four years. And she said, I may have a little piece of information for you about Tom Moncrief. And I want to bring a few of the family with me. And so she did. She brought the whole family. These are all the grandchildren of Tom Moncrief's brothers and sisters, all cousins. And she said, would you be able to visit Tom Moncrief's grave in, in Belgium? And we looked and the school were organising a French trip. Yes, we can. We can. We can certainly do that. Would you like us to take something on your behalf? Yes, we would. We had no idea what it would be. If you look on the table, there's a tiny little blue cylinder. Tom Moncrief was a farmer. The whole family are still farmers. They farm all over Scotland from, um, let me think, East Lothian, Fife, Angus, where else? Dundee. They're, they're, they're from all over Scotland. And what they did, they went to Toft Hill Farm near Perth, which is where Tom Moncrief lived in 1914. And they got a little piece of earth, a little, a little cylinder full of soil from Toft Hill Farm. And we took it to France with us. And that's a young girl called Dana. And she's sprinkling a little bit of Scotland in front of Tom Moncrief's, Tom Moncrief's grave in Belgium. And this was a magical moment for us and for them as well. So there's our connections. The next one, I think, is friendships. Okay, they are friends. The people that we've connected with are friends. I can only mention one friendship, and that's a friendship that we de developed with St. Matthew's Church down on Tay Street in Perth. 
we got together in 2018 towards the centenary of the armistice because of a project called There But Not There. These um, acrylic kind of silhouettes that you can sit in various places um, during the, the celebration of the armistice. But we did much more than that. I can just mention two events. One event that we did is the next slide, which is a walk past the flowers of the forest. The children decided that we wanted to do something to connect the old school, which is down on, on the uh, overlook in the North Inch in Rose Terrace, and the school that we're at now, which is up at 1.7 miles away in Viewlands. The school on Rose Terrace was the home of the school for a great number of years and that is the school that the flowers of the forest would have attended. And so the Academy Powell's platoon mustered ready to go first thing in the morning, Friday morning, we walk along to um, St Matthew's Church, we get a bacon roll, we get a cup of tea and in the windows of shops and restaurants and care homes and guest houses we have the posters uh, there's a poster in the window there of that shop that's john ferguson if you think of open all hours okay that's john ferguson's shop you can see his shop in the background he's a lovely guy and he's a former pupil of perth academy quite a long time ago but definitely one of ours okay and he said i'd love to put this posters in our window so we walked along as a group of pals. Peter, are you going to see in a moment, is on there as well. It wasn't just the kids, it was people who we've made these connections with. We marched up, we didn't march, we kind of walked and blethered and spoke to people and waved to people through windows, blew kisses to people in the care home. A wonderful, wonderful moment in time for our Flowers of the Forest Group. But also, many of those children are not members of Flowers of the Forest Group. It was kind of starting to make connections with other young people in the school as well. St Matthew's Church organised a tribute concert and they called that Always With Us. That wasn't all they, that was a culmination of a week of events in their church. But they had their own, uh, the people that belonged to St Matthew's Church, their own musicians, their own singers, their own readers, and they invited the school to take part in that again. So. We have the school orchestra, we have the choir, we have people doing readings, we have solo singers, um, another wonderful night. The upshot of that is that over that period of a week, we raised a thousand pounds, which was then donated to the There But Not There project. So we're kind of putting something back as well. And the There But Not There project supports um, veterans and their families. Gonna, I'm going to have to speed up a bit, I think. Okay. Very, very quickly, Alan Mingus, a, a former pupil of the school, one of only four people who fell in the Great War that has a plant named in his honour. It's called a Primula mingusiana. And he worked at the Royal Botanic Garden in Edinburgh. He was a trainee there. He died in... Battle Lose 2015 and the people at St Matthew's Church said they were going to have a memorial garden and in that garden they're going to plant primulas and there we are and the, the young people who went on a visit to France had a bake sale raised nearly a hundred pounds handed that money over to St Matthew's Church towards a garden and if you look second from the left on that side that is um, a lady called Leonie Patterson, who is the archivist at the Royal, Botanic, Royal Botanical Garden in Edinburgh. She came all the way from Edinburgh to attend somebody handing over a cheque. She felt a real connection with Alan Mingus as well. That's, that is us at the Lewis Memorial, so that's a young man called Billy. We've got our wreath there, and at the bottom of that there's a little bunch of primulas as well. History, that's the old academy building from 1807 to 90. I'm talking to kind of architects and archaeologists here. I'm not going to say too much. I think it's a beautiful building. If you look directly below the clock, slightly to the left, there's a, there's a, there's a space on the wall. There's something missing. What's missing is a war memorial. It's a bronze plaque. It's now in the school because in 1932, it went up to the school. And people that came to school said, where's the old school building? Where's the, where's the war memorial? Where's the plaque? And they said, well, we, there isn't one, but we can do something about that. 
So, gentleman on the right at the back, the tall gentleman is Perth and Kinross Heritage Trust. He said, well, I'll provide the expertise, because it's a listed building, it's not going to be easy. I'll provide the expertise, you raise the money, that's a deal. And now there is a plaque in the space where the school memorial was, and that's a little bit of history that these young people were involved in as well. Our final ceremony was for James Patterson. James Patterson didn't die until 1919. He died of bronchopneumonia in London, and he's buried in Highgate Cemetery. Do you remember Alison, who came to the school, who lives in Kent, and said, would you like me to go to Highgate Cemetery on the same date that you have a ceremony at the school? This is kind of rounding off four years of work for these young people. I'll find James Patterson's grave, I'll take my daughter with me, I'll send you some photographs, and we should be the next. No, I missed the slide, it doesn't matter. Can we go back one? No, it doesn't matter. No. So, we had a ceremony at the school, and, we, and they joined us in, in kind in Highgate Cemetery in London. Right, remember Georgina? Second from the right at the bottom. Remember that wee shy girl that stood at the back and wouldn't, wouldn't be in the photograph? Look at her, happy, smiling, confident. I'm not saying we did that. I think a lot of people made that, uh, Georgina the person she is now. But after five years of that project, th this is my little family. This is, these are the people that I grew to know over a five-year project at Perth Academy. Our Flowers of the Forest project. I'm very proud of them. I'm delighted to be able to tell you the story. I've probably gone over my time. I'm going to shut up. Thank you. Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Now, my name's Peter Olsen. I'm from Schoon Remembers. Now, there's lots of people in this picture. What I would like to say, and this is a theme that's actually gone through the whole of the conference this morning, is that all the projects, every single one of them, would be absolutely nothing at all. It wouldn't even start if it wasn't for the volunteers. So well done, you people. There's 101 people in that hall. This was the, the culmination of a four, five, almost a five-year project uh, to remember the 72 men from Schoon who died in the First World War. Now, we didn't want to dwell on the fact that they were blown up in trenches and had bits flown all over the place and things like that. We, we were not quite interested in that. We were interested in the people themselves. Not just them, who they were, what ranks they were and what regiments they were, which is really, really important, but their families, their mothers, their fathers, their siblings, their aunts and uncles, where they lived, what they did before they went into the army and what their grandparents did, what their parents did. And this we felt was much more important. So we got together a few people who would know about these things, and there, most of them are there at, in, 1918, uh, in 2018 when we celebrated the final amnesties. We also had to raise some money, because to do this, and to do other things as well, we needed a fair bit of money. Now, we tried the lottery on two or three occasions, and they told us to go away, we weren't good enough, we weren't clever enough, we didn't do the forms right, we had missed things out, so we decided to raise money ourselves. Now, you've heard about people talking about the fact that what's for lunch? Well, I tell you what, barbecues are better, especially if you have alcohol involved, because people are very, very generous. So we had lots and lots of barbecues, and we raised on average 1,500 to 2,000 pounds on each barbecue. And these were the locals from the, from the village, not people from all over the place. We also wanted to get involved with the, the community, more, more, more the, the young people. Now we wanted to get across to the fact that wars happened and wars are important and wars you need to know about. And the earlier you start with a child, the better it chances are that you remember that. So we had traditional egg hunts in the quarry mill, which is uh, uh, just in, uh, near Schoon. And as you can see, there's crowds there with their parents and things like that. And we, we were a little bit crafty in the sense that we scattered eggs all over the place, which was donated by the local co-op. 
and we hid them in all sorts of nooks and grannies. And amongst those eggs, we would put in a small um, picture of one of the individuals on the memorial, one of the individuals we were researching. And if a child found that, he would come back and we would tell his story. And if he listened, or her listened, which they often did, they got an extra egg. Parents weren't all that happy about it, I have to say, but especially when they had about a dozen eggs themselves before, beforehand. They got a bit hyper towards the end, I wonder why. Now there are some of the, 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 the locals, and they're looking quite pleased with themselves. Uh, those baskets were full of eggs. Special prizes. These are the, this the individual, he managed to find a particular man, and he, he talked about it, and he wanted to know about it. And he got another big, uh, big Easter egg. We also had tombolas. Once again, children involved. We get the gambling thing, which is probably probably wasn't the best thing to do, but we raised lots and lots of money. And we also had uh, strawberry fairs where people enjoy themselves, and we have one of those every year. All the cakes, all the strawberry fair bits and pieces, the flans. The, all the rest of it were baked by local people. It didn't cost us a thing. All the ingredients were donated by local shops, strawberries by local growers. All those things went into it, and people enjoyed them. We had volunteers pouring tea, and other volunteers eating. That's my daughter. Right. You, you know about when you start something, and you think, well, this is going to be a fairly straightforward thing. We will look at 72 individuals and we'll, we'll find out what, what's going on with those. And uh, then you've probably heard the expression, it grew arms and legs. Before long, we, have, we had a team of a half a dozen or so uh, genealogists, uh, some far away as Malta professionals, who were researching into the individuals and getting the information. A lot of the information we found out there, uh, especially with the... Um, the roles of uh, honour was incorrect. It was uh, misleading. The dates were wrong, the regiments were wrong, all sorts of things. And we managed to sort those out. And we also found out where they lived, how they lived, and also who of their relatives are still alive. We produced it into a book. The school remembers our men from the Great War, lottery funded. We got seven and a half thousand pounds from the lottery to produce 250 books and some other bits and pieces. I still have a few left if you're interested. Special price, 15 quid, upstairs. So these are the people who were um, involved with it. it. Was Graham, unfortunately Graham is no longer with us. He died before the book was published, but there you go. That's on Elaine, Denise, Leslie Ann, John, Dawn. And there's an the example of what's inside a book. It is hugely researched. He has lots of maps, lots of graphs, and uh, all sorts of things, but it's highly detailed of who that individual was. In the top right hand, or top of the page, you see a QR code. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute or two elsewhere. But if you scan that with your smartphone, you will hear an audio file of an individual telling that person's life story. Now, that might be a relative who's still living, or, well, obviously, it won't be a relative who's dead, but. Um, the, uh, or somebody related to the person where he worked. Or in, in, in terms of a general, we had a general doing the, uh, the, doing the actual uh, um, talk about him. And he tells his story about his family, where he was, and things like that, straight off the internet. And this has is, this is be be become extremely popular. These are the guys who, uh, this is John, who actually did the writing of it and editing of it. The editing is probably the most difficult thing you could do, what to leave out and, uh, and how to do it. And Dawn in the, in the corner there, she, she did a lot of the writing. The readers. Now this is for the audio files. Uh, some of you might recognize some of those people. The top left hand corner, that's our provost. And we have people, uh, youngsters, uh, from the, the, the local, uh, they weren't the scouts, they were the uh, boys brigade. They did the writing. And we have people in the village who are known in the village. And the bottom left-hand corner, that's um, William Stormont, because 11 of the men we researched 
They came from skin pallets. They were gardeners and foresters. And we treated them slightly different in the sense that uh, they're not, their uh, memorials are not in the village. I'll tell you about that in a minute or two. All around the, the village, we have plaques. And this was not lottery funded. We funded this ourselves. But with a QR code outside on lampposts, and each one of the plaques has a, a picture of the individual. It has a QR code and some information about them, about their regiments. Now this, I believe, is, was unique. It's no longer unique, but this is done about two, three years ago. This is a, a sound walk where people could walk along and outside each of the uh, areas where you have the plaque is close to where the person lived, or their family lived, or where he worked. In the top, top left-hand corner there, that's the uh, in Schoon Park, those are the plaques for the people who didn't actually reside in Schoon itself, but they lived in the general area of Schoon, the Schoon um, and some of them a few miles away, so they would be fair for people to walk up there. But there's a special way you can walk around and listen to them. And, that's, and you see from time to time people standing inside scanning the QR code. Just the other day we had a crocodile, a crocodile of uh, primary fives, walking around taking notice of it. So th these things have become extremely popular. We had to replace the, uh, the, the plaques on, um, just recently because uh, the, the people who print them um, forgot to put the anti-bleaching. Uh, In other words, the sun used to bleach them and turn them all red. So we've replaced those. But those are the sort of thing. Perth and Kinross Council were very, very good in, in allowing us to put them on the lampposts, I must admit, so long as we uh, did it in their way. Right, these now, to, to do the actual memorial walk um, information, we had the local artists sit around and draw drawings and put them into a map, which, uh, which is, there's some maps at the back there. I'm happy for you to take them away with them. We've got lots of them. And, we, and uh, that's how we did it. So this has really been a totally and utterly uh, community involvement. Uh, nobody gets paid, and uh, and apart from the, the grant, the very significant grant from the from the lottery uh, for the book and book only, uh, the rest of it was was for ourselves. We also got to keep maintenance for the, uh, the website, and that's a bit of a worry because uh, it's not going to last forever. But uh, we hope that uh, it will continue to do so. Now, Schoon Palace, we said there was 11 individuals from the Schoon Palace area. Now, you may recognize the man crouching. That's uh, Brian Cunningham. You'll see him on, uh, on the, one of the gardening programs, uh, Beach Grove Garden. He's, he's a regular on that. Now, each one of those individuals have an oak tree planted. And the uh, Schoon Palace is looking after that and keep it going. And if you go up there, you always find people. It's a bit out of the way, but it's well worth it going up there. It's a nice walk, and it's, it, it does well. And there's a family for James Robertson, a military medal. That's a sad story for James Robertson. Uh, he wasn't in, a, he wasn't in the, the main war. He was in Ireland uh, during the war, looking, making sure that the Irish weren't rebelling too much. And he was with the Black Watch, and he was coming back on leave, and his ship was torpedoed and he drowned. His family still has his leaf chitty, all water stained. He really should be in the museum, but they keep it in the drawer in the kitchen. But that's the whole family, long, many, many generations of the uh, Robertson family. We also went abroad. Each year we've gone abroad, we've gone abroad and uh, laid crosses amongst the people who are, whose graves we've known. We've found one or two mistakes, which we've tried to rectify, but it's not an easy job. We went across with the King's own spot, Scottish borderers for uh, the, the song celebration. It was a, a very memorial thing to do, and also very, uh, a very nice thing to do, so we can see what the people are thinks. Now, finally, I have to do this because it's, it's, in, it's in my contract to tell everybody who supported us. And as you can see, we had lots and lots and lots of support uh, from Tesco's, uh, from uh, Schoon Palace, of course, Schoon 50 Plus, 
Stephen's the builders. Um, they're not very much liked in school, so we're but uh, but they keep on building houses, which nobody wants. Uh, Morrison's, the Village Association, and of course, with lots of other people as well, including the cooperative uh, funerals. So that they were the first to give us some money. So that is Schoon Remembers. Uh, our project is has now come to a close. We need just now in maintenance. And uh, it was only ever going to be a four-year project. It lasted five years, and I suspect you'll go on for another five years on, on, on things like this. I thank you for your attention.